can tell we already have a very special service for you today with our special guest, Jackie Nunez. Uh, and surrounding this service, we're also doing kind of a, a, something a little bit different. We're surrounding this service with poetry, because I think that poetry gets us to look at the world differently. And I think that's what this world needs right now, is to look at things differently, get us in a different kind of mindset. So the poem that's holding this service together is by Joy Harjo, who is a Muskoki Indian poet and performer. She's also our National Poet Laureate, the first Native American Poet Laureate of this country. The poem is called Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. And she begins with a quote by uh, the poet, the um, Dine poet, poet, Norman Patrick Brown, when he said, I am the holy being of my mother's prayer and my father's song. So conflict resolution for holy beings. Number one, set conflict resolution ground rules. Recognize whose lands these are on which we stand. Ask the deer, turtle, and the crane. Make sure the spirits of these lands are respected and treated with goodwill. The land is a being who remembers everything. You will have to answer for your children and their children and theirs. The red shimmer of remembering will compel you up the night to walk the primer of truth for understanding. As I brushed my hair over the hotel sink to get ready, I heard this. By listening, we will understand who we are in this holy realm of words. Do not parade pleased with yourself. You must speak in the language of justice. Quickly, but sadly, <laughs> our history was buried. Our history, as the influx of the new people, they buried our culture. And in burying our culture, we had to learn another culture, which was the Spanish. In the last 45, 50 years, we have been uncovering those things that were buried. And the song that I'm going to sing was studied by one of our tribal members in the Smithsonian Library, where an archeologist went in California and began to document songs and languages through the works of J.P. Harrington. And they were documented on cylinders. And we retrieved it. And we began to learn our language again. To come today to share with you this heals my mother's heart, who has now passed on, who was taken from her home and put in a boarding school, where Native children were treated like second-class citizens, where her hair was cut, and children spat on uh, adults from another race, spat on the ground so my mother would walk on it, where they had to go through the back door because they weren't allowed to go in the front door. This is our history. It is true. But as I come today, and you treat me with such respect and love, it heals a generation. Nonka, 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 I get my more, 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 Oh, one more thing. Is it the children? Yes. Okay. It's the children now. 
So I would like to invite any children and children at heart up here to join Jackie. She's going to teach you basket weaving. Actually, they're going to do that in, the, in their religious education class. Today. Today she's going to tell a story about basket weaving. <laughs> Have a seat, you guys. You can see wonderful pictures here. So before I give that little lesson and before we leave, it is in our truest tradition of protocol that we gift your minister an abalone shell, a little bag with sage in it, crushed, prepared by my family, and a little piece of sage that you may have on behalf of our nation and to know that we are grateful for this invitation. Thank you. I'm really touched. You're welcome. So there's two lessons. The basket that you see on the stand there took many, many hours. The basket that we are going to um, make is only going to take a little bit of time. Every basket starts with a belly button. And we say it's the belly button. It's the birth of the basket. It's where the basket begins, right there. That's your belly button, yeah. That's, that's part of your life, too, when you were connected to your mother. This right here is yucca. And may I set that there or no? So boys and girls, I want to show you this, but I want all of you to see it too. This yucca is so important because the men had to make rope, and rope was the most important tool that we had. But one thing about yucca, one strand, easily broken. We can choose to be all by ourselves. We can choose to not have friends. We can choose to walk in the world angry. But I challenge you instead, to be like this yucca right here. And we braided it. And we intertwined it. And it's not easily broken. Coming to church, you're breathing your life. Listening to your parents. Listening to the teachers. Being involved in sports and, and, and art and everything. You're making a braid that's not easily broken. Would you stand up, my friend? Pull that and see if you can break that. That is not easily broken. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and so our baskets that we're going to make today will be small, which just like this, we can pass it around and look at it. And it starts like this, and they unwind it, and we have a weaver. And so, boys and girls, I want to tell you, I've been a teacher a long time, more than 40 years. That's a long time, huh? Probably your mother's not even 40, right? They're probably my age. Would you hold that for me, love? And I go to schools, and sometimes I'm talking to as many that are here today. And as I was teaching them about basket weaving, and I want all the boys and girls here to open your hands like this, take your finger and say, over, over. under, Wait a minute, everyone do that. Come on. <laughs> Say over, over, under, under, under over, over, over. Now, I was at a school and there were more than 200 children I was speaking to. And believe it or not, the creator was speaking to me. Even though I was speaking to everybody, and he said, you're like the basket. And I'm thinking, of all the times that you want to talk to me, I've got 200 kids as my audience. And he said, life is like the basket. Over, which are good things under, which are struggles, and you go over and under. But if you hold on to this weaver, which is our relationship with the universe, for me, my relationship with Jesus, over and under. And if I hold on to that at the end of my process, and even though it could be a bad day, my sister calls me, oh, she's so depressed. My brother is HIV, my mother, passes away, my other brother is stabbed by skinheads and dies. Those things can be little ones or big ones. You know what could be a big one too to a mother? Can't find her keys and you have to be in school. <laughs> that could be an under. Over is you graduating and making the most beautiful picture that says, I love you, mom. And when you're done, the basket leaves. Right there, my love. You become a vessel of service and you help others. That's the greatest gift that you can be, using your gifts and your talents, all right? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Thank you so much for sharing my heart. Are we ready?
would like to invite Steve and Jan up here to join me for today's reading for continuing the poem. Two, use effective communication skills that display and enhance mutual trust and respect. If you sign this paper, we will become brothers. We will no longer fight. We will give you this land and these waters as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers run. The lands and waters they gave us did not belong to them to give. Under false pretenses, we signed. After drugging by drink, we signed. With a mass of gunpowder pointed at us, we signed. With a flotilla of warships at our shores, we signed. We are still signing. We have found no peace in this act of signing. A casino was raised up over the gravesite of our ancestors. Our own distant cousins pulled up bones of grandparents, parents, and grandchildren from their last sleeping place. They had forgotten how to be human beings. Restless winds emerged from the earth when the graves were open, and the winds went looking for justice. If you raise, if you raise this white flag of peace, we will honor it. At Sand Creek, several hundred women, children, and men were slaughtered in an unspeakable massacre after a white flag was raised. The American soldiers trampled the white flag in the blood of the peacemakers. There is a suicide epidemic among Native children. It is triple the rate of the rest of America. It feels like wartime, said a child welfare worker in South Dakota. If you send your children to our schools, we will train them to get along in this changing world. We will educate them. We had no choice. They took our children. Some ran away and froze to death. If they were found, they were dragged back to the schools and punished. They cut their hair, took away their language, until they became a stranger to themselves, even as they became strangers to us. If you sign this paper, we will become brothers. We will no longer fight. We will give you this land and these waters in exchange as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers run. Put your hand on this Bible, this blade, this pen, this oil derrick, this gun, and you will gain trust and respect with us. Now we can speak together as one. When we say, put down your papers, your tools of coercion, your false promises, your posture of superiority, and sit with us before the fire. We will share food, stories, and songs. We will gather beneath starlight and dance and rise together at sunrise. The sun rose over the Potomac this morning, over the city surrounding the White House. It blazed scarlet, a fire opening truth. White House, or Chogo Hutki, means the house of the peacekeeper, the keepers of justice. We have crossed this river to speak to the white leader for peace many times since the settlers first arrived in our territory and made this their place of governance. These streets are our old trails, curved to fit around trees. As Jackie mentioned, we buried a lot of histories. I talked about this last week. We buried the history of lesbians in our culture, our history throughout. If we want to change the future, we also have to, in a sense, change history. We have to talk about those buried, those invisible histories. And today we're talking about another history that's been made invisible, that of the indigenous people of the US. It's a pretty blazing trip through history, mind you. But some of us have heard that phrase, as long as the grass shall grow and the water run. It comes from Article 5 of the 1861 Treaty between the US government and the Comanche, and what was described as the Comanche and other tribes. Each tribe or band, it said, each tribe or band shall have the right to possess, occupy, and use the reserve allotted to it, as long as the grass shall grow and the water run, 
and the reserve shall be their own property like their horses and cattle. Here's the thing, the US government knew that when they wrote those words, that it was a lie. How do we know this? Because we knew about, they knew about the doctrine of discovery. So the doctrine of discovery. So back in 1493, right? 1492, we all learned that phrase, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? Well, 1493, when he came back, and let everybody know about this new world, new to them. Pope Nicholas, at the time, put out a, this doctrine. He based it on the Bible and said that because, of course, if you remember that in the Exodus, the Jewish people came out of Egypt and went into the land of Canaan, and there they colonized. They went and they subjugated, kicked out the Canaanites, and they said, so Pope Nicholas basically said in the Doctrine of Discovery, well, since that's precedent, any Christian monarch has the right to claim any land of non-Christians. <clears throat> and moreover, you could, you could plant a cross or a flag there, but you, you had to do more than that. You had to actually, like Joshua and Canaan, you had to occupy and subjugate the land and its peoples in order to claim it. And this doctrine was then applied throughout the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Now, after the Revolutionary War here in the United States, the new government had to decide what to do. After all, right, we're no longer a monarchy. We're a democracy. So what do you do? Well, after all, Spain and Portugal and Britain had all basically claimed all of this land. Well, in an 1823 U.S. Supreme Court, they ruled that the discovery rights of the European monarchs transferred to the U.S. This is a quote from that ruling. The United States then had unequivocally acceded to that great and broad rule by which civilized inhabitants now hold this country. They hold and assert in themselves the title by which it was acquired. They maintain as all others have maintained, that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy, either by purchase or conquest. So that 1861 treaty, as long as the grass shall grow and the waters run, was a lie. Now how do you subjugate and colonize so that you can claim the land? Well, one is that you can buy the land. Now, keeping in mind that, you know, when you put your house on the market, right, you're, into, you're in a capitalist market, right? You're on the market, and so many people can bid, and that rises up the price. There was just one purchaser in the land of the Indians held at gunpoint. In fact, I wasn't taught this in history, Lewis and Clark, right? They were gonna go find the Northwest Passage. That was part of it, but part of it was also that after the Louisiana Purchase was made, right, we, we all thought we got such a great deal out of the Louisiana Purchase. Actually, what the Louisiana Purchase did, it actually didn't sell them land, it sold them discovery rights, which they didn't, of course, ask any of the natives whether or not they agreed to that. And so part of what Lewis and Clark were doing was going in to, do, to create discovery rights in that land. Now because of the US's adoption of the doctrine of discovery, tribes were not allowed to deal with any other nation if they wanted to sell land. And that's to this day. Natives cannot sell their land. They have to go, it has to be an act of Congress. And in fact, the US would buy land at gunpoint and then sell it back at hugely up-priced markets to settlers, European settlers. So yes, you can buy the land, but it's basically highway robbery. So what else can you do? You can buy the land, you can kill the natives, particularly if they don't sell you the land to make you feel better. <coughs> and the third thing is, is that you can assimilate them. You can take children from their parents, 
You can make it illegal for them to practice their traditions and speak their language. And Jackie spoke very eloquently about that this morning. In this area, the Tongva and Hashiman tribes were never actually put on reservations. Instead, they were forced to work building those missions. San Juan Capistrano, Gabriano, all of those. But mostly, they were assimilated by those missions into an idea of what they thought Christians should be. They were taken from their hunter-gatherer ways and taken from their traditions and forced to not speak their language. And somewhat ironically, this has also meant that because they were not put on reservations, they have no land to claim as their own. And therefore, they're not a federally recognized tribes. They're recognized by the state of California, but not federal, which means they don't have access to federal monies and self-determination, as those on reservations do. Oh, it's so hard to learn this kind of history, isn't it? And you might say, well, you know, we didn't know that. We, we know better now, right? There's no more assimilation in our schools. But then again, you know, what are the alternatives for Native children right now but to belong to this culture? And so much, as Jackie mentioned, has been lost. Well, there is attempts. There has been attempts at trying to give some land. In 2016, there's a 65-acre park was approved by the city of San Juan Capistrano <coughs> to create a cultural and education center for the Hashiman people. They've been asking for this since about 1980. But it's currently on hold because they can't figure out some zoning ambiguity, <coughs> even though there's no opposition to this whatsoever. They have tabled it. And Chief Romero of the Hashiman people, she said, well, what else can we expect? So trust is shot. The US government has not had effective communication skills. They've been lying. So how do we change that? I just to invite you to just take that in, take all of this in. We're asking big changes, uh, big questions today. I don't know what the answers are. It seems such a simple thing to keep a promise. Take a few deep breaths. Why is it so hard to keep promises? give constructive feedback. We speak together with this trade language of English. This trade language enables us to speak across many language boundaries. These languages have given us the poets, Ortiz, Silco, Mamade, Alexi, Diaz, Erd, Woody, Kane, Bitsui, Long Soldier, White, Erdrich, Papa Hanso, Howe, Lewis, Brings plenty. Akpik. Hill. Wood. Miracle. Cisneros. Trask. Hogan. Dunn. Welch. Gould. The 1957 Chevy is unbeatable in style. 
My broken down, one-eyed Ford will have to do. It holds everyone, grandma and grandpa, aunties and uncles, the children and the babies, and all my boyfriends. That's what she said anyway, as she drove off for the 49 with all of us in that shimmying wreck. This would be no place to be without blues, jazz, thank you, motto to the Africans, the Europeans sitting in, especially Adolf Sachs with his saxophones. Don't forget that at the center is the Muscogee ceremonial circles. We know how to swing. We keep the heartbeat of the earth in our stomp dance feet. You might try dancing theory with a bustle or a jingle dress or with turtles strapped around your legs. You might try wearing colonization like a heavy gold chain around a pimp's neck. It's important to recognize that as we point out all these varied horrific histories, that there's also a lot to be proud of in this country and in European with a broad, that has been brought over. It hasn't all been bad. It's important to acknowledge that we that we acknowledge these histories, not as an either or, but as a both and. There have been contributions from so many countries that have made this country amazing, as Harjo points out, jazz and the blues from the African Americans and saxophone from the Belgians. But what we don't do is we don't acknowledge the contributions of the native peoples, from poetry and the arts to academics and medicine, you name it. But to me, one of the greatest gifts from the native peoples is how to live in harmony with the earth. Having lived here in this area of Orange County for over 12,000 years, the Ahashima and Tongva have a lot to teach us, those of us who might be more recent arrivals. For example, this area, you may or may not be aware, used to get flooded a lot. The Santa Ana River is one of the largest river or riparian ecosystems in Southern California. And unfortunately, it currently looks like this. <laughs> the Hashemen were, once upon a time, were semi-nomadic. They were hunter-gatherers in this area, and they followed food sources up and down the coast as they needed. And they knew that the river would flood. They were smart. They, they paid attention. So they didn't build their villages too close to the river out of respect for it. But the mindset of Europeans with the mindset of that doctrine of discovery is that if something is in the way of what you want, you don't work around it, you subjugate it. The Santa Ana River, particularly down in Orange County, is no longer a lush ecosystem providing all forms of, for all sorts of sustenance for plants, animals, and human life. It's now a concrete waterway entombed, controlled, and subjugated. I have a picture here from the last flood in 1938, the last major flood. It was soon after this, the picture on the left is the flood, soon after that it made into this concrete, its waters for the most part just channeled and it destroyed the ecosystem. With this doctrine of discovery mindset we see that land is something to be conquered, subjugated, not worked with. Now I'm somewhat new to California so those of you who are not and been around, maybe you already know this, but you know that the California grizzly bear, the symbol on our flag, do you know that it's extinct? Originally, it's estimated that there were over 10,000 grizzly bears here in California. And they were wiped out within 75 years of the gold rush because they were seen as a threat to the rancheros and those who were gold panning. The natives considered the bear a brother, a grumpy one that you kind of stayed out of this way, mind you. <laughs> But for European settlers, again, it was an animal to be subjugated and killed. <clears throat> what would it mean to live in harmony with the land? Not treating it to be as something to be conquered and subjugated. What would that mean for us here? What would it mean for us going forward? Again, in a spirit of meditation, I just invite you to consider that. What would it mean?
reduce defensiveness and break the defensiveness chain. I could hear the light beings as they entered every cell. Every cell is a house of the God of light, they said. I could hear the spirits who love us stomp dancing. They were dancing as if they were here, and then another level of here, and then another, until the whole earth and sky was dancing. We are here dancing, they said. There was no there. There was no I or you. There was us. There was we. There we were as if we were the music. You cannot legislate music to lockstep, nor can you legislate the spirit of music to stop at political boundaries, or poetry, or art, or anything that is of value or matters in this world and the next worlds. This is about getting to know each other. We will wind up back at the blues, standing on the edge of the flatted fifth, about to jump into a fierce understanding together. How do we get to know one another? How do we do this? It's difficult to hear horrific things about the country that you love. I consider myself a patriot. I love this country. There's much of it to be proud of. There's also a history of br brutal subjugation that we've only started to acknowledge. And you kind of can't take the good without the bad. Like, you got to take the whole package. <coughs> and even harder still was when I learned that the Unitarians had a part to play in the subjugation and assimilation of Native peoples. When the U.S. government in the 19th and 20th century wanted to assimilate Native Americans, they asked clergy, they asked different denominations to step in. They thought it would lower the level of corruption. So the American Unitarian Association, the precursor to our Unitarian Universalist Association, they took responsibility for the Ute tribes in Colorado. They sent four Unitarian ministers to be agents to make sure that policy was implemented. That policy was to make sure that the Indians were assimilated into becoming farmers even though they were hunter-gatherers, and to teach children how to be good Christians. They were not particularly effective. As they were hunter-gatherers, the Ute were, were hunter-gatherers, they were forced to farm on reservation land that was not suitable for farming. Now, one of the ministers was recalled, and he was replaced by the government by a man named Nathan Meeker. He was not a Unitarian, not one of the four original clergy, but he was affiliated with the AUA. In other words, he still sent reports back to the AUA. Meeker did not know anything about Native peoples, didn't even try, and he angered them, trying to force them not only to convert to Christianity, but to farm this unfarmable land on a reservation they were given because specifically it was unfarmable. And the Ute people were people of horses, so they, a lot of what they do has horse races involved and everything. And so uh, he, he would make up stories about how he felt threatened uh, and asking for help, but whenever they did any research on it, they found that no, he wasn't actually threatened. So he decided as a way of forcing them to... Uh, to go along with it is he plowed a, the field that they used to graze their horses and do the horse races. So the Ute struck back and it became known as the Meeker Massacre of 1879. Now I'm sort of horrified that my denomination had anything to do with that history. In 2009, at our General Assembly, Bill Sinkford, the president of the UUA then, went before and acknowledged this history, he stated to the Ute people, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations offers our heartfelt apology. We participated, however ineptly, in a process that stole your land and forced a foreign way of life on you. We ask for your forgiveness and we promise to stand with you as you chart your way forward. Forrest Kuch, an Ute leader, was there speaking as an individual and said, I accept your apology 
but your forgiveness is not going to solve everything, but at least it's a start. So where do we start? How do we apologize, even here in Southern California? What it would, mean, would it mean to reconcile? Just invite you again in that spirit of meditation to consider that. What does that mean? How do we move forward? negative attitudes during conflict. A panther poised in the cypress tree about to jump. Is a panther poised in a cypress tree about to jump? The panther is a poem of fire green eyes and a heart charged by four winds of four directions. The panther hears everything in the dark, the unspoken tears of a few hundred human years, storms that will break what has broken his world. A bluebird swaying on a branch a few miles away. He hears the death song of his approaching prey. I will always love you, sunrise. I belong to the black cat with fire green eyes. There, in the cypress tree, near the morning star. So the problems we have around oppression, the problems around environmental devastation, all stem, can be linked back to this idea of the doctrine of discovery. <clears throat> this idea that we must conquer, conquer, subjugate, or assimilate the peoples of, and the world around us if they don't what we, do, what we, those of us in power, want it to them to do. We still live in a culture created and upheld by this doctrine of discovery. Most of the problems today can be traced back to it. So how do we solve this problem? Is it more conquering, more subjugation? Well, Einstein, that brilliant man, said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We're not gonna solve this world's problems. It won't be with the same thinking. It's time to turn to a different way of working and seeing and being in this world. I'm indebted to uh, Sarah Kimball for sending me this wonderful article by this gentleman named Charles S Sepulveda. He's a member of the Tongva tribe and professor at the University of Utah. He suggests that we can use the Tongva word kuyam as a place to begin. Kuyam means guest. When the settlers and missionaries first came to Orange County, they were greeted with open arms. Constantly we hear this in all of the reports. We walk into a village and they came running out to greet us, inviting us for food. They were invited into their homes because the local tribes believed in hospitality. Sepulveda writes this, he says, settlers in California and elsewhere can be guests on the land they live on. Kuyam is the local indigenous peoples to the, 
Kuyam to the local indigenous peoples, but more importantly to the land itself which contains spirit and is willing to provide. The earth, which has been treated with disrespect by humans on a global scale, continues to be welcoming. The concept, however, of Kuyam under current conditions is difficult to the point of nearing impossible. However, the conditions of impossibility have been met and overcome by indigenous ancestors in their audacity to survive throughout history. Residents of Tongva land, for example, can be Kuyam and not act as colonizers or seek to further domesticate the environment for their own benefit. They could be welcomed guests and not looked at by the native community as settler colonizers, no matter their skin color, histories, or origins. The status as Kuyam is neither demanded or ordered. It is instead a relationship offered and chosen. A relationship offered and chosen. Will we accept that offer? And know what we do matters, bringing meaning to this mystery. For like ripples on a pond, our actions carry far beyond us. We are connected, connected intricately. The key to Kuyam is to be in relationship with the land and with its native peoples. When we have a sense of kinship with a place and its people, we want to protect it and get to know it. As Kuyam, as guests, we bring, we begin by repudiating that doctrine of discovery. We can do that in various ways. We can do that by acknowledging, like we did this morning, the land on which we reside as being Hashiman and Tongva lands. <coughs> we are all Kuyam when we listen to native peoples. We are all Kuyam when we use their names, Ahashiman and Tongva. We are Kuyam when we support access to native ancestral and sacred places. We are Kuyam when we support the cleanup of the Santa Ana River, which has been used as a sewage dump by corporations. As Unitarian Universalists, I believe that we are called to be Kuyam, guests in relationship to the land and its native peoples. So let us put down our papers, our tools of coercion, our false promises, our posture of superiority, and sit with indigenous peoples before the fire. We will share food, songs, and stories. We will gather beneath the starlight and dance and rise together at sunrise. And when we have done this, we will begin to repair the earth and all its relationships. Let us sing of this wisdom emerging. Please rise and bow your spirit.